All right, we're now going to discuss uh, for the integument uh, section two, part C, the excrine glands of the skin. And now we're talking about the sweat glands and sebaceous glands specifically. And the sweat glands include two types, the merocrine and the apocrine glands. Uh, the merocrine or eccrine glands, same thing, uh, are sweat glands, the most numerous and widely distributed of those sweat glands. They're simple coid tubular glands. They discharge secretions onto the skin surface. The production, or they produce secretion by exocytosis. Uh, they secrete sweat, and that's again composed of 99% water, which we mentioned before, and 1% other chemicals. Not significant enough to say that you sweat out toxins. Shouldn't really say that. You sweat out water, pretty much, and a little bit of other, of other things. And of course, electrolytes and metabolites and waste products are part of that 1%. And they play a major role, or the American gl gl glands with that sweat play a major role in thermoregulation, particularly in cooling specifically. Uh, the apocrine or apocrine sweat glands are coiled tubular glands. They discharge secretions of the hair follicles uh, located in the axillae around the nipples and pubic and anal region as well. And they produce secretion by exocytosis as well. And they produce a viscous cloudy secretion, unlike sweat, which is more watery. And it contains proteins and lipids. And it produces an odor when acted on by bacteria. And that's typically what you smell like under armpits and, and those areas of the pubic regions and anus uh, and in those areas whereby you have odors as due to more of the African gland secretions as opposed to American gland secretions. And uh, that said, you start producing such apocrine gland secretions during puberty uh, with the growth of hair, right, in those areas. Uh, sebaceous glands are the holocrine glands. Holocrine glands should not be confused with the uh, uh, sweat glands. And the holocrine glands are, produce only an oily secretion called sebum, and it's a lubricant for skin and hair. And it's bactericidal. Uh, it discharges on, into the hair follicle, and the secretion is stimulated by hormones, especially androgens, and it's activated during puberty. And the endocrine glands are basically helping communicate with to form, to actually create exocrine gland function or exocrine gland secretions. Uh, other integumentary glands, which are technically modified apocrine, apocrine glands. The textbook, in the attempt to kind of try to differentiate the glands, they can in some ways may have confused a little bit for the different uh, types of holocrine, apocrine, or American merocrine glands. And the struminous glands and merimary glands are technically modified apocrine glands. They're specifically from the apocrine family, so to speak. Uh, and the uh, struminous glands are just located in the external ear canal. It's where you get your earwax, uh, called cerumen. It traps foreign material and lubricates acoustic metis and the eardrum. Uh, and the mammary glands, obviously uh, the nipple essentially, modified apocrine sweat glands of the breast, and they're, they function in pregnant and lactating females producing milk. So the exocrine glands of the skin. You see our sweat pore here from our merocrine sweat gland, up that sweat gland duct, and the pore at the ep epidermis at the uh, stratus corneum, stratum corneum, stratum corneum. And then the uh, hair follicle here, uh, we have our sebaceous gland here on the side here, secreting sebum onto the hair follicle. And the erector pili muscle, which actually over here, which actually is going to help stimulate that, you know, get that goosebump response, uh, basically involuntary muscle response here. And then apocrine sweat gland here, actually also going to the hair follicle, just like the sebaceous gland does. And the, ap and the uh, apocrine gland, of course, being the apocrine family, sebaceous gland being the holocrine family, so to speak, and then, of course, our merocrine or eccrine sweat glands. So, again, merocrine sweat glands here, showing that vesicle containing secretory products, uh, and then uh, secret secretion in the duct. They all have ducts. Every one of these does. Exocrine glands secrete via ducts, whereas endocrine glands do not uh, have ducts. And, uh, and exocrine glands secrete basically... Uh, onto the surface, essentially, whereas the endocrine gland is uh, secreted in the bloodstream uh, with hormones. Uh, and the apocrine glands, even though this actually refers to the mammary gland as a apocrine gland, which is true, it's a modified along the ceruminous gland, uh, but we're typically are thinking more of the apocrine glands referring to the ones that at the hair follicles and in, in, uh, more in the pubic regions and the uh, axillae uh, under the armpits uh, and whatnot. And of course, the hologram sebaceous glands play a role with those hairs as well, with the sebum being secreted. Uh, acne and acne treatments. Uh, acne is plugged, basically results from plugged sebaceous ducts. Okay, it typically begins during puberty, and increased activity gland secretions may block the pores 
Uh, treatments include benzoyl peroxide, salicy salicylic acid, antibiotics, vitamin A-like compounds, and systemic retinoids, helping to re unplug those sebaceous ducts. And of course, uh, acne can lead to scarring if it's untreated. So uh, what's the difference between uh, eponychium or eponychium uh, and the hyponychium of a fingernail? We should know that. Uh, what are the three zones of a hair? Uh, how does hair function in protection and heat retention? How do apocrine sweat glands differ from americrine sweat glands in terms of the location, secretions, and function? And what does sebaceous glands secrete and where is this material secreted? And then lastly, distinguish between regeneration and fibrosis and describe the process of wound healing and talk, I should say, uh, now talking more in section three, I should say, with repair and regeneration of the integumentary system, you should know the uh, difference between regeneration and fibrosis and describing the process of wound healing. So. With tissue being repaired, uh, it's going to happen one of two ways, regeneration or fibrosis. Regeneration is replacement of the damaged or dead cells with the same cell type and restores organ function. Whereas fibrosis, a gap is filled with scar tissue, collagen is produced by fibroblasts, and functional activities are not restored, unlike regeneration where functional activities are restored. So the stages of the wound healing, uh, cut, blood, cut blood vessels bleed into the wound and blood, cut, blood clot forms and leukocytes clean the wound. Uh, the clot's a temporary barrier for pathogens, just temporary. And the blood vessels then regrow and granulation tissue forms. And a vascular connective tissue is initially formed in the wound. And the epithelium then regenerates and connective tissue fibrosis occurs. Restoring function when, with regeneration. In situations where, can't, where tissues can't be regenerated. So here we have that wound with the epidermal layer down in the dermis, deep into the dermis. We have leukocytes playing a role with helping to clean up. And then we move into the second phase of blood clot forms and leukocytes clean that wound, the macrophages and fibroblasts, okay, here, macrophages there, and our neutrophils, all part of our immune system and dendritic cells. And then the blood clots and at stage three, blood vessels regrow and granulation tissue forms. We said granulation tissue here, macrophages still present, uh, regrowth of that blood vessel, and here's all those uh, Basically, all the fibroblasts down there as well playing a role, still to some extent. Although we don't see the neutrophils as much at that point, that stage. And we have a scab uh, here now forming with regenerated epidermis and the scar tissue. And you have obviously less activity here. You see a lot less of those uh, fibroblasts present. You don't see the macrophages anymore at this point. And the epithelium is regenerating and connective tissue fibrosis occurs. So with psoriasis, it's a chronic autoimmune skin disease. Uh, Cretinocytes are attacked by T lymphocytes of so the immune system. Uh, and obviously that's not a good thing. We don't have to want our, fighting our own body's systems, our own body's cells, um, think that there's something wrong. That's essentially what's happening. Uh, it's basically a, a, a difference between negative feedback and positive feedback. Essentially here is positive feedback promoting additional response when it's actually trying to reverse that response uh, because it's not something the body wants to basically attack and destroy uh, the cretinocytes from the T lymphocytes. It causes rapid overgrowth of new skin cells, patches of whitish scaly skin on the epidermal surface. Symptoms include severe itching, pain, and skin cracking. And uh, treatments are corticosteroids or UV light, ultraviolet light therapy, and medications that interfere with skin cell production. Burns are a major cause of accidental death. Uh, they're caused by heat, radiation, chemicals, sunlight, electrical shock. They're a threat to life mostly from fluid loss. Uh, it plays a great role in affecting fluid loss. Uh, and, also, and from that, then with fluid loss, uh, opening up for infection and the effects of the burn, do the effects of the burned tissue. First degree burns involve only the epidermis, slight redness and pain, immerse uh, the burned area in cool water is the idea. Second degree, uh, part of the dermis is now damaged below the epidermis. Skin's blistered and painful and slight scarring. Still looking to burn air, uh, basically immerse it in cool water to some extent. Uh, for the initial phase there, but it's going to be some scarring there. Third degree involves epidermis, dermis, and the subcutaneous layer. Uh, basically, it's by, by degree by each layer, right? Requires hospitalization, treatment of dehydration and infection. That's when it becomes very concerning. Require additional caloric intake. This is something that a lot of people don't take into account when they're sick in general. When they're sick, they're ill, their immune system is fighting something. The majority of people often hear starve a cold. Some people even think it's starve a fever, you know, feed a cold, starve a fever, or feed a fever, or starve a cold. Don't starve any of them. You feed them all. 
Uh, the idea is to give your body enough of what it needs, because right now your body's working at a higher level, try to heal itself. Actually, it's in higher gear than normal. So why we'd want to cut our food intake, I do not know, except for the idea of when there's challenges more with digestion or some issue whereby it's affecting the system by taking in too much food, which is obviously not what you want to do. But certainly, generally speaking, you should be taking more, assuming you're laying around in your well versus you're laying around and you're not well, you should be eating more when you're not well <laughs> of the right things, of course. Uh, and this can be severe scarring with third-degree burns, and it may need debridement and skin grafts, which we're not going to talk a great deal about, but that'll come up to some extent more later on. Uh, burn severity can be measured by a rule of nines, uh, estimates the surface area of burns. Okay? That's a typical rule that referred to uh, with burns, which again is not pertinent for us at this moment. But uh, treatments for burns include man managing fluid loss, relief swelling, manage pain, removing dead tissue, controlling the infection, and increasing caloric intake. So you should be able to now answer, what's granulation tissue and when does it appear during the wound healing of the skin? And we'll come back for our final section with aging and of the integumentary system.